Without hyperbole, the Surface Pro 11 is the pinnacle of what Microsoft has been trying to achieve with Windows on ARM since the first Surface RT devices launched in 2012. There have been massive bumps and bruises along the way, but the devices available right now are far removed from those original tablets. Even still, uh, there are caveats in key areas that will prevent the Surface Pro 11, or any Windows on ARM machine, from being ideal for everyone. However, a lot of those caveats are currently related to either the legacy Windows apps favored by businesses, or the heaviest technical use cases favored by the same folks who actually have a reason to buy laptops with dedicated GPUs. I've already covered some of those exceptions with my initial gaming review, and I'll cover much of the rest in a future video. For this video, I want to be a bit more realistic. Most of y'all watching this video aren't planning to use a Surface Pro for tasks like video editing or machine learning. Rather, this would be a thin and light laptop substitute, mostly used for checking social media, watching movies, or casual sketching. If that's you, the main things you're going to care about in deciding whether the Surface Pro 11 is right for you are, does it feel good to use? How long does the battery last? And how does its price compare to the competition? And that's what I want to focus on in this video. If you have one specific factor you want to know about the most, feel free to check out the video chapters. Let's start by talking hardware. Up front, this is pretty much the nicest Windows tablet on the market. The aluminum chassis, sturdy kickstand, and dense design scream premium. The lack of a headphone jack is sorely missed, but the two USB 4 and one Surface Connect ports, all three of which can handle charging by the way, are more than enough for a tablet. Around front is a display which will vary based on the internal processor. The cheaper X Plus versions have an LCD display, whereas the X Elite version I have comes with an OLED display. Both come with a 3x2, 3K, 120Hz panel, which includes dynamic refresh rate and stellar stylus support. The main difference is that the OLED version has substantially more contrast and may drain less battery in conditions where most of the screen is black. Whether I'm watching YouTube videos or responding to emails in Outlook, my OLED display feels good enough that I never really have to think about it, but still enjoy using it. It's clear while reading articles and smooth while browsing web pages, helped quite a bit from my X Elite processor's solid general performance. In general, there's this softness to it that I'd say feels comfier overall than the LCD on my Surface Pro 9, though not enough to call it a must-have difference between the machines. My sore spot with the display comes from its brightness, which could be better. Under direct sunlight, Everything remains visible, but only just barely. The reflectiveness of the display also means battling reflections from any light sources pointing directly at it. Luckily, in more practical indoor use cases, brightness is felt more than adequate, even if still not excellent. At home, I've had no issues kicking back on my couch reading tech articles. Meanwhile, typing out a script in a local cafe never left me wanting for a different device. All of which is great, because the compactness of this machine, with or without a keyboard, makes it feel perfect to stash in a bag and take with me on my trips around Chicago. Finally for the hardware, let's talk microphone and camera, because they're actually relatively decent here. The camera exposes well, whether under normal ceiling lights or in a mostly dark room. Meanwhile, the microphone does a great job clearly picking up my voice without it sounding distorted or grainy. If you're someone who often has video chats with others, this is a tablet that will keep you from looking and sounding like a potato without an external webcam. It's all without enabling studio effects, by the way. Studio effects allow for system-wide background blurring and auto-framing, and a bit of additional brightness to the portrait. They work well and will be great for anyone who needs to make sure their background is always blurred or wants to have a call without sitting in front of their computer all the time. I dig it. Of course, Surface Pros can have all the nifty features in the world, but would still suck if their battery life weren't up to par. Fortunately, during my typical usage, the Surface Pro 11's battery tended to last 8 hours or more before the low battery warning popped up. 
When put to sleep, it's also kept its charge exceptionally well, with less than 10% drain from a full day of non-usage. For context, I tend to set my display to auto brightness and 120Hz dynamic refresh rate, alongside a recommended power profile. Edge, Word, and PhoneLink tend to always be open for me, alongside Steam running in the background. I've no doubt folks looking for a bit longer usage would be able to optimize their setup more than mine to squeeze even more life out of this device. But I felt no need to make changes to my usage. Like the Surface Pro 9 before it, this is a computer I could easily take on a weekend trip and leave my charger at home. However, it is worth noting that getting worse battery life is also pretty easy. Obviously, running more intense programs will drain the battery faster. During my recent sessions playing SteamWorld Dig 2, I found myself getting 5 to 7 hours of battery life without issue. Likewise, using Adobe Fresco to sketch a Viper landed me in more of the 4 to 5 hour range. As a rule of thumb, if you're performing any tasks that necessitate the best performance power profile or cause the fans to kick in, battery life will likely take a hit. But the bigger factor for battery life among folks viewing the Pro 11 as a productivity machine will be whether the apps they want to use have native ARM versions. If developers haven't yet released versions of their software optimized for Windows on ARM, the Pro 11's compatibility layer kicks in. That extra layer of processing consumes a bit more battery and processing resources in general. As a result, my typical usage may yield different results than your typical usage due to the apps you like to use. Luckily, that's become even less of an issue over time. The biggest web browsers, Chrome, Edge, and Firefox, all have ARM-optimized apps available. Meanwhile, common standalone apps, like the Microsoft Office Suite, Slack, and Spotify, are also optimized for these systems. Realistically, most folks shouldn't run into any issues, but, there are edge cases. Certain popular apps like Discord or Clip Studio Paint have still yet to provide an ARM update. How those apps will perform varies greatly based on how the app was developed or what you're trying to do in the app. Most will run just fine, even through the compatibility layer, but come with a small penalty to battery life. Others, like Discord, may feel a bit more sluggish in operation. It's Really hard to tell until you try it for yourself, to be honest. Although, if you run into a case where performance isn't optimal, but there's a browser-based version available, you could always try to install a progressive web app. There's no guarantee performance will improve, but hypothetically, you should at least bypass the compatibility layer's penalties. Unfortunately, even with a decent amount of support available, you may also run into cases where certain apps, like Arc Browser and Google Drive's desktop client are essentially blocked from running on these machines by their developers. In those cases, there's not really much you can do except wait for the developers to come around to Windows on ARM. In general, if there's an application you know you can't live without, it might be best to do some research ahead of time to see if an ARM native version is available. Or if not, how performance has been for others in the past few months before spending your money on something like this Pro 11. Which brings us to the price. My X Elite Surface Pro 11 with 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes of storage alongside a Slim Pen 2 and Flex keyboard costs about $2,000. That's a lot of money. Though, honestly, maybe not a lot compared to the competition. A new 512 gigabyte 13 inch iPad Pro with Magic Keyboard and Apple Pencil Pro costs about the same price, just with a less useful operating system. Likewise, a similarly specced 13 inch M3 MacBook Pro or Snapdragon X Elite equipped Dell XPS 13 will set you back about $1,600 to $1,800 when not on sale, which is close enough to consider the price difference as form factor related more than anything. At the moment, my Surface Pro 11 uh, doesn't actually seem like a terrible deal. Not that you actually need to pay $2,000 for a Surface Pro 11. If you're someone mostly looking to use this tablet for productivity purposes, I'd sooner recommend the base $1,000 
X plus model than mine. You'll have marginally slower performance, not that you'll likely notice, and won't get the nice OLED display, but it'll be more than enough for social media, emails, and Netflix. Making that cheaper decision also gives you a bit more flexibility with your budget. If the 256 gigabytes of onboard storage, the base spec, aren't enough for you, you can spend the extra money you saved replacing it. For a few generations, Surface Pros have had easily replaceable SSDs. All you'd need to do is push on the back panel with the system turned off and unscrew the drive to remove it. One terabyte drives can be easily found for under $100 on Amazon and will save you a ton of money compared to letting Microsoft upgrade the storage for you. Likewise, the Flex keyboard and pen are optional. Opting for no keyboard at all is completely valid. Touch navigation and typing in Windows 11 is really good on this device. Anyone planning to use a Pro 11 first and foremost as a tablet doesn't need to spend the extra money. Plus, nothing's stopping you from connecting a USB or Bluetooth keyboard and mouse you already own when you actually do need it. For those who know they'd really like the extra versatility and screen protection of the keyboard though, the same Surface keyboard with a Slim Pen 2 charging cradle that's been available for previous Surface models is still available for $170 less than the Flex keyboard, while a keyboard without a Slim Pen charger only costs $140. Folks should only be looking at the Flex keyboard if they aren't price conscious and want a Surface keyboard that can still function while detached. Though, as a heads up, the software connecting the Flex keyboard hasn't been the cleanest experience. The trackpad often takes a second to wake up after a few minutes of non-usage, and I've previously experienced the battery not charging while my Surface Pro slept. The versatility of the design makes up for a lot of those negative points for my usage, but know that you're dealing with some jank going in. Still, if you don't need a detached keyboard and don't care about Surface pens or already own one of the older pens, you could easily grab an X Plus equipped Surface Pro 11 with a Surface Pro keyboard and one terabyte of storage for around $1,250. That's still a bit of a premium price tag for a premium product, but not unreasonable for a device like this. If you're considering a Surface Pro as a productivity machine, my top tier setup works wonders, but know that you don't have to go that route to get its stellar everyday performance and battery life. Which, from my perspective, really ties the Surface Pro 11 together as a great computer for folks who already aren't shopping around for the most powerful machines on the market. Its dense, lightweight tablet form factor, stellar battery life, and competitive price tag come together to make possibly the best all-around Surface device I've ever used. The only real hitch holding it back at this point is the lack of compatibility for certain apps. Though, with the latest Windows on ARM push, increased adoption and hardware options should help reduce that issue further over time. Just know that if you're new to Windows on ARM, a lot of those compatibility issues are becoming rare and more niche. For most folks, anything they'd use this computer for is already going to work great on this platform. Having a versatile, reasonably performant tablet to access that platform is just going to make their lives a bit more comfortable. Those are my thoughts though, I'd love to know yours. What are the biggest use cases you have for your laptops? And does the Surface Pro 11 seem to fit your needs? Let me know down in the comments. As always, if you found this video helpful or informative, go ahead and give it a like to let me know and then get subscribed for more Surface related videos in the near future. As I mentioned at the top of this video, I'm working through the script for more prosumer use cases. And you know, it's going well so far. This video was actually edited in Premiere Pro on my Surface Pro 11. It works pretty great. I just didn't want to drop a 40 minute video on y'all discussing use cases for two very different types of consumers. I'm also kind of hoping that the rumored Qualcomm graphics driver updates will drop before I record that video so I can give y'all an update on game performance. If there's Anything else you'd like to know about the Surface Pro 11 from the performance side of things, feel free to post it down in the comments. If it's something reasonable and within my skill set, I've no problem providing additional info. 
Anyways, that's going to be all for this video. Thank you so much for watching all the way until the end. And until next time, catch you later.